My oldest daughter had to have been four years old. And at the time, she had never said, Dad, you write better than I do, or you run faster than I do. But when we went on the golf course, she said, Dad, you hit the ball further than I do. And that really clicked to me that for some reason, she didn't feel like a peer or capable of her skills relative to mine on the golf course. And so what I do with young kids now is when we go play, I'll hit shots that they're capable of hitting. If their driver goes 100 yards, I'll play a little shot that goes 100 yards. And it looks about like there's the same kind of trajectory. And when we get around the greens, instead of going real high with a shot that I could play at, I'm going to have to play a shot that they're capable of playing so that they can see what those types of shots look like. And in all reality, it makes me a better golfer because sometimes those aren't my first option, and so I would need to work towards being able to play those. Hi, this is Ward Shaw from St. Louis, Missouri, and I play at Greenbrier Hills Country Club. This is Golf Smarter number 829. This episode is brought to you by Dynamic Golfers, and Ward Shaw has just won a year-long membership to Dynamic Golfers for introducing today's episode. Stay tuned to hear how you can, too. Getting your child started with golf, then getting a college degree in PGA Golf Management with Henry Statina. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Henry. Hello, Fred. How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm really curious. You're, you're in New Mexico. You're a lifelong New Mexico resident, right? Absolutely. Born and raised. There you go. Not really a golf destination, is it? Uh, not so much. Um, there are some great golf courses in New Mexico. Um, I, I happen to grow up in the, in, the, in the northern part of the state, in Santa Fe. And so there's some good golf courses in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. I'm down in Las Cruces now. So there's a few really good golf courses, uh, but certainly not a destination. Yeah. But um, the the elevation, well, when you get up to Albuquerque, right? You get, you're playing an elevation then. Yeah, there's going to be about 5,000 plus feet in uh, Albuquerque. Uh, what are Santa your favorite Bay's courses? 7,000 and, and we're right. down here about 4,000. So yeah, there's it's definitely a, a high desert and, and then we get some snow in the northern parts. And where are you based in New Mexico? I'm in Las Cruces. Uh, the Las very Cruces. southern end of it. And that's where New Mexico State is? Yep, New Mexico State University. Uh, about a 15,000 student university, um, Division One NCAA program. Awesome. And you're part of the uh, PGA Golf Management program there? Correct. Yep, I'm the program coordinator. I'm involved with uh, primarily player development and instructor development. Okay. I want to get into that too. I'm fascinated by that because I know that you work with a lot of young people and college students as well. But let's, let's stick to golf for a minute in, in New Mexico. Um, cause you know, I, I have some friends that we travel every year and try to go to places around the Southwest. And anytime I've brought up, uh, New Mexico, they're like, there's golf in New Mexico. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I guess there, there's <laughs> got to be golf, right? Not a lot, but there's got to be some golf there. What's your favorite course? Yeah, there is. Um, so I grew up in Santa Fe. Uh, I grew right. up playing the Santa Fe Country Club, a small semi-private club. Um, that's always going to be my favorite club. Um, but man, there's some, there's some good new modern uh, championship style resorts. Um, Black Mesa is just north of Santa Fe. Uh, Cochiti, sub, uh, just south of Santa Fe, is a good one. Um, Paco Ridge is one of the greatest golf courses that anybody would ever play. Um, that's just east of Albuquerque. Uh, Paco Ridge? Had, what, what is so special about that? You know, it's just a... It's just a unique golf course. It's uh, very large in, in nature. It's it, it travels through the uh, Pinon style hill country of, of uh, kind of a mountainous area on the eastern side of the Sandia Mountains. Um, they have a new ownership. 
they've invested some money in renovating the facility, and it's uh, it's it's becoming a quite the destination for sure. Hmm, fascinating. Well, I'm going to make a trip out there someday because it's a beautiful green country. Uh, they have a green on on Paco that has a hundred yards from front to back. Why? It's just a <laughs> unique design feature. I don't know. Uh, depending uh, on the conditions, a person could hit anywhere from. I'm sure sand wedge all the way up to a, a fairway wood. I mean, depending on the wind gust, that that hole can vary a ton. And you get a lot of wind there too? Um, there's some wind, yeah, southern parts for sure. But uh, yeah, I mean, 100-yard length green, uh, different hole locations and different wind conditions, That that's going to vary quite a bit. I can't imagine looking at my GPS and it says, you've got 100 yards to the front of the green. 150 to the center and 200 to the back of the green. <laughs> I can't. It's like, what? Wait, that's got to be a mistake, right? No, yeah. it really is. a hundred. How do you practice a putt? If you're on the front of the green, do you just chip it? What do you do? I guess. That's yeah. You, you <laughs> half that's swing cr- putt. <laughs> that's crazy. I just, I just, you can't even prepare for something like that. You can't practice. There's no place to practice that. No, no. Did do you know? Did like the was there a lot of negative feedback about that? If people made comments like "this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen" or what, "the greatest hole ever with a hundred yard green" and it's no, only think, ten yards wide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's the greatest hole, but it's certainly a, a memorable hole. Uh, clearly, we're talking about it. Uh, I, yeah, I think right. a lot of people see uh, you know unique. Um, I mean, like you said, how many times have we ever been able to even attempt a hundred foot putt? I, I can imagine that players yards, yeah. see the or a hundred yards, yeah, see, see the uh, the whole location either in the front or the back, and they have to go to the other side of the green to try it out. Wow! And and is their practice putting green really big? Do they do they give you the opportunity to practice a shot like that? Uh, no, definitely not. There's, uh, there's putting, <laughs> practice putting green is much smaller. <laughs> because that's a lot of real estate. That is, is that a par four? It's a par three. Do you know? Par three. Par three. A par three? Yeah. No, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. A par three with, so like the green is like 10 yards from the tee box, the front tee box? Because <laughs> you still have to hit it 100. And, that's, okay, I'm going to have to look up pictures for that one. 100 yard green i'm gonna look up and see and that's at paco ridge correct yeah okay par three that is i'm gonna be talking about that way too much my, with my friends they're gonna like okay okay we heard about it quiet <laughs> <laughs> um all right let, let's talk about uh your the work that you do with young kids um, because you've spent a lot of time. There's a beautiful video on the, the uh, New Mexico State University website on their golf management program that features, that talks a lot about you. Um, and these kids just adore you. I mean, they want to be you. Congratulations. Thanks. I don't know about that, but yeah, that's certainly, uh, <laughs> certainly a neat video. And, and we've been fortunate to have a lot of support uh, through the university, through the golf courses in the community, and then uh, the community itself. I mean, uh, the PGA Junior League program has become a uh, kind of a staple within our community and has allowed golfers of, you know, all walks of life to experience the game for maybe the very first time. Tell me more about the PGA Junior League. So uh, PGA Junior League is a team approach for introducing kids ages 6 to 17 uh, to the game of golf. Uh, It puts them on teams, and it gives them jerseys and numbers, and it allows them to uh, explore the game and learn the game, similar to that of a Little League soccer team or or a baseball team. Um, And I I can't imagine that um, in New Mexico... That a lot, a lot of the families there, a lot of the kids come from families that have never, I, I guess they would never have played golf before. This is new for the whole family, right? Yeah, I think that's what attracted me towards PGA Junior League was 
um, growing up in New Mexico, I was one of only a, you know, a handful or several kids who played the game. Um, it wasn't until I got to high school that there was another kid playing golf in the school that I was attending. And so I could totally relate. And um, I got into coaching PJ Junior League. Uh, I guess we're going on five years now. And um, at the time, they had introduced a scholarship for kids who qualified for free or reduced lunch at school. And to me, that was the uh, the catalyst for creating a program. We grew a program from six players in, in uh, 2017 to uh, 106 players in 2018, primarily as a result of the scholarship program. Wow. Um, yeah, tell me more. Keep going. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, it, cost is a barrier to entry for golf for many people. Sure. Sure. And, uh, and so being able to reduce the cost or in a lot of cases eliminate the cost was, a, was an opportunity that we saw that allowed us to, you know, develop a program. We were looking for maybe 20 to 30 players and it just kind of blew up on us to where we had over 100 players that first year. And um, with, with most of them being on scholarship, we needed to get equipment for them. And so uh, working for the university, I utilized our PJ golf management students to kind of allow them to help by cutting down sets of clubs, old sets of clubs, and piecing them together to make uh, little youth sets that the players could at least start with. And, uh, and then we needed coaches. And so what we did was we hired the PJ golf management students who happened to be in the area uh, during their summer internship uh, to help as coaches. And we paid them for their, for their services. And um, it started out as a way of, of just getting kids into the game, and it turned into a great uh, partnership between the PJ Golf Management, the local golf courses, and then the community because um, we're kind of all in it together, uh, growing the game and giving college students an opportunity to learn to coach. Well, you should be very proud of yourself to get involved in the community in such a way that gives kids skills that are well beyond a sport. Um, we all know what, what golf can do to build character. And um, yeah, you should be really proud of yourself. That's, that's really awesome. Thank you. Really I appreciate awesome. that. Sure. Listen, we're going to take a quick time out. We'll follow up with that. We'll be back with Henry Statina right after this. This episode of Golf Smarter is brought to you by Dynamic Golfers, who provide daily 15 to 20 minute long video workouts that target muscle imbalance common to golfers. You know, I spend a lot of time on YouTube, probably more than any other app. <laughs> you would probably guess that I like to watch golf videos. Unfortunately, most of those are focused on swing mechanics, flaws, fix. You know what I'm talking about. Along with YouTube, of course, I've interviewed hundreds of golf instructors on how to become a better golfer. The hook that sucks us in is about increased distance and eliminating your slice and eliminating your hook. They make it look so, so simple to just do ABC and your slice is gone forever, right? What I've noticed is that all of these assume that you can make that complete turn on your backswing, or you have a body like they do, or that it's simple to keep your arms extended throughout the entire swing. They want us to believe that quick fixes with equipment and training aids will fix it all, but ignore that as we don't have time to spend hours each week just practicing, or our bodies just don't move the same way as we age. Whether because we're out of shape, working out the wrong way by focusing on endurance, increased heart rate, or building muscle, which are good things, but not necessarily for golf. But the secret they're not sharing is flexibility and mobility. If this is familiar to you, then I would like to suggest that you try Dynamic Golfers. Dynamic Golfers isn't yoga, it's not calisthenics, it's simple, easy-to-achieve dynamic stretching that's designed to help the average golfer. Now, as you track your progress, you'll feel and see the results within four weeks. 
The Dynamic Golfer app offers more than 400 daily stretching and mobility video workouts that will take more than a year to complete. Mixing and matching workouts that focus on different parts of your body each day so that you can make a swing that will correct your slice or add more distance. I'm a testimony to that. Right now, Dynamic Golfers is offering Golf Smarter listeners a seven-day free trial and 15% off with a coupon code GOLFSMARTER. One word, Golf Smarter. Join the thousands of golfers worldwide that include Dynamic Golfers multiple times each week or even daily in their daily routine. And it only takes 15 to 20 minutes. Plus, it's not the same workout every day, so you won't be bored by repetitive positions. Again, go to dynamicgolfers.com slash golfsmarter and sign up for their seven-day free trial and 15% off the membership with coupon code GOLFSMARTER. And how would you like to get a full year membership for free? Simple. Write to me at golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and tell me that you'd like to introduce an upcoming episode. Get the details at the end of this episode or check out your show notes. I'm a habitual user and it's helped me become a better pain-free golfer. So check it out for yourself. Dynamicgolfers.com slash golfsmarter. I'm fascinated by the fact that you're bringing in some of the students from the, the golf management program into this opportunity to be able to work with kids as well. Um, how significant, how large is your golf management program at the, at the university, state university? So um, our, our program will fluctuate anywhere from 80 upwards to 100 students per year, depending on the year. Um, prior to my arrival, uh, in 2014, um, there wasn't really much for a teacher development or player development component. And um, at the time, our director, Pat Gavin, who's been with the program since its inception, uh, was able to get a new line, a, a new staff line within the program. And he hired me with the intention of, of developing that type of a uh, you know, role within the program to increase player development, to increase instructor development. Uh, we built an indoor facility. We have state-of-the-art equipment um, to help students become better golfers and then to also build some skills to become teachers. And as things progressed, we started to take our students to the local schools to teach golf and PE classes and then to the Boys and Girls Club teaching golf on uh, blacktop playgrounds and at local parks. And uh, as things developed and as we were introduced to PJ Junior League, that was just the next step. And um, over the years, we've had uh, dozens, uh, probably upwards to 50 or 60 different PGA golf management students have the opportunity to coach through PGA Junior League. And uh, this past fall was the first time that 100 percent of our coaching staff were either uh, current students or graduates of the program, which was quite nice. Awesome. That's awesome. Now, are the students at the New Mexico State University uh, PGA Golf Management Program, are they mostly locals? Are they mostly from New Mexico? Or do you have a lot of people who are um, making that a destination, not the golf, but making the, the university a destination? You know, that's a, that's a really interesting question because the university itself – uh, is primarily comprised of in-state residents. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the PJ Golf Management Program is quite the opposite. 80 to 90 percent of our students come from out of state. Wow. Our program, yeah, it was established back in 1987. Um, for a very long time, it was one of four PJ Golf Management Programs nationwide. And uh, over the years, there have become more uh, throughout the country, but we've still stood strong as being one of the leaders in the industry. And uh, we attract students from all over the country and even all over the world. That's fascinating. And now what I'm curious about is when you come across kids, say, in your junior league program or even uh, 
prospective students to the PGA Golf Management Program. Um, these are clearly kids who grew up playing golf, who are at your, your program. Um, are these ones like, oh, I just love playing golf and I want to be a golf teacher? Are there people that you say, you know what? That's not what this is about. This isn't going to be an opportunity for you to play golf all the time because, as you probably well know, once you start getting involved in the profession of golf, you don't get to play golf often, <laughs> right? <laughs> and most teachers I talk to, they're like, yeah, I don't get to play anymore. I'm just teaching. So is this something that you ever, you know, try to talk to kids and try to vet them out of why are you going into this? You know, the students who, who come to us, they love golf. Um, for whatever reason, golf has become something quite meaningful to them and they want to make a career out of it. Or maybe they're not quite sure what they want to do, but being able to get a full-fledged college degree, uh, we're housing the College of Business. They get a Bachelor's of Business Administration with a major in marketing, um, while at the same time being able to still play golf and compete in tournaments and work in their game and be around that golf culture is, is, is quite a nice way of getting a college degree. And so um, it's, it's not very common for students to come to us with an idea of, of just simply wanting to be a coach and that it's going to be a, an easy route. If anything, most students come to us thinking that they're going to play college golf and play on the PGA Tour and and whatnot. And, and so what we end up having to do is to explain to them that, you know, there's only a select few who make it to Division One golf and to make it to the PGA Tour. And uh, what happens if, if that doesn't work out? I mean, we're going to do everything in our power to help those individuals become as good a golfers as they can. Um, but having a career in golf is a great second option. Um, being able to share the game with others, being able to introduce children to the game, to be able to work with military veterans, to, to be able to, uh, you know, give a lot of people this incredible experience that we were so generously given um, through some other mentor or family member who introduced us to the game. And so um, that, that tends to be the case, um, that they're, they're looking for an elite level of play. And, and through our program, we're able to offer them a tournament program uh, anywhere from 18 to 25 tournaments per semester so that they can continue working on their skills and to um, get that competitive feel. And if they are able to um, be among the elite players in our program, they can participate as members of teams that compete regionally and nationally. And every now and then a special player will come along who gets the attention of the golf coach who, who gets recruited to play on the team. Uh, one of our one of our graduates, uh, Brett Walker, uh, he came to us and uh, for the program, and he worked hard and he got onto the golf team. Um, he became uh, one of the members of the traveling team, the number one player on the team and captain. And then, uh, as of last year, he competed in the PGA Championship. So uh, there's a perfect example of an individual who took the opportunity of attending the university for the PJ golf management program, kind of parlaying it into a, a career on the golf team. And then now a playing career, which has some potential of making it to the PJ tour. That's phenomenal. You kind of answered my question. I was going to ask you about the golf team there. Do you have a competitive golf team? Um, and are they, are they in conjunction with one another, your program and the golf team? Yeah, we're, we're Division I NCAA uh, University, so our golf team is, is, is quite competitive. We're a smaller university, but, man, they're still really good. And um, we do allow students to participate both in the PJ Golf Management Program and compete on the golf team. Um, at the moment, we have four students in the program and on the team. Of those four, all of them were recruited to come play for the team. And uh, being that we had the PGA program was kind of an added bonus for them. Uh, but yeah, we def definitely have a good working relationship with them. Those individuals uh, tend to be a little bit more involved in the golf team culture. Uh, we allow them to complete the PGA golf management program to the best of their ability, maintaining uh, 
you know, the, 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 the requirements and objectives of the program. And then when they go on their internships, they tend to be able to work at courses with graduates who also played on the team or facilities that would allow them to spend a lot of time working on their game playing and practicing. Wow. That's great. That's very impressive. Listen, we're going to take another time out and we'll be back right after this. Henry, the pandemic has been hard on everybody, but it's been amazing for golf. It really has. Uh, un- unbelievable how much business has been created, how much uh, golf courses are booked, how many teachers are just booked up all, all the time. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a shame what's going on, but it has been wonderful for golf. And uh Testimony to you, uh, you were named the number one golf instructor in New Mexico for 2019-2020. You must have been very busy, and uh, congratulations on that. Thanks, thanks. That was uh, quite the honor. Yeah. Um, So let's talk about golf instruction. Um, Do you have private students as well, or are you mainly focused on the university work? I work primarily for the university, uh, mm-hmm. Monday through Friday, eight to five. I'm working with our students on their games. I am working with them on their instructional abilities. I'm teaching class, um, creating programs for them to conduct. I do teach a bit on the side. I, I teach at the Red Hawk Golf Club. It's a, a facility here in town, a public golf course, 18 hole championship golf course with. Uh, 7,800 yards from the back tees, a beautiful practice facility. And they've been kind enough to allow me to be their director of instruction where I teach individually. I do some junior golf classes uh, that take place on Saturdays throughout the year. They're a year-round program. And then that's where we conduct our PJ Junior League, both in the summer and in the fall. At Red Hawk? Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so where, where, when someone once told me, someone I was interviewing, I don't remember, was I said, so how do you get good at golf? And he said, start when you're six. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> Great. That really helps. Somebody who started when I was in my 40s. Um, how, how do you get kids? Because golf, from a, a child's uh, point of view, especially with all the you know video games and everything else going on, everything moving at a fast pace, how do you convince children that golf is fun and exciting and an adventure what is, what's the secret you're asking uh, the million dollar question golf is uh it, it takes a while to get isn't that what at. you get paid at, at, at new mexico state university yeah that is yeah. it's a it's a it's a great game and it takes a little bit of work to get good at kids i feel can pick it up a little bit quicker than adults in most cases really um what, what we look to do is we look to make it fun. We like to allow the kids to uh, participate in a group setting. PJ Junior League has been fantastic because of the team environment. The jerseys make them feel part of a team. They get to choose their numbers. Uh, they're coached by uh, our students. And um, so we're making it fun for them. Uh, we, we've developed a curriculum um, that's based on five steps. And the entire program is designed for them to learn those five steps, anything from, you know, grip, aligning of the club face, setting up, um, identifying with the target and then making a swing. And, and if we can introduce that to them with putting and chipping and to see some success and then to take those same concepts over to the driving range and to have the familiarity of already having a little bit of success and and then we make sure we take them on the golf course. Half of our program, even if they're absolute beginners, is spent on the golf course, um, playing two and three person scrambles um, with a coach in the group, um, encouraging and motivating and basically shepherding them throughout the golf course. I'm, I'm very, uh, I stress the importance of identifying what a green is and the fairway and a bunker and, you know, identifying the equipment that we use and, and basically familiarizing them with the whole facility. Um, I want them to feel comfortable with the golf course, not only the kids, but the parents. I, I tend not to coach with PGA Junior League. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of 
do my rounds, make sure the coaches are all being taken care of and they are equipped with the with the resources that they need. But I like to spend time with the families, make sure that the families are comfortable because a lot of times for us, the parents haven't ever played the game and they don't feel very comfortable there either. And sure. so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking to basically make it as inviting as possible and, and to see some success early on um, while always making the game fun. Tell me about the five steps. I mean, what what do you what are your five steps to get them? Yeah, going? So, uh, so you've actually had a guest on your show named Ed LeBeau. Yeah, um, a few years back, and uh, he's a mentor of mine, and we worked very closely. Wait, how did you know? How I, did you I, know he was on the show? I, I've heard the show. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> it, was a, it was a great episode. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and um, you didn't so, tell me that. Uh, you know, we, we, we looked at creating a curriculum. We had 106 kids. How are you going to teach 106 kids for the very first time with coaches who were teaching for the very first time? Oh, my gosh. That's a challenge. And so, yeah, what we did was we, we welcomed them to the course, to the driving range. We had set up bleachers on the driving range like you would see at a soccer game. Sure. And uh, some driving ranges have that rope identifies where you're going to hit your golf balls from. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a rope, we basically set up paper plates every six paces or six, six feet or so uh, rows and rows of these paper plates to where the kids were going to stand between the paper plates. And those were going to act as their target lines. And we introduced them to five steps. The first step was to hold the club with a neutral grip being that the palms were facing each other, the club looked relatively normal in their hands. The second step was to uh, raise the club out in front of them and to identify that the grooves were vertical. Now we're announcing these with a loudspeaker and our coaches are among the players conform, confirming that they're doing it correctly. Mm -hmm. the, so we've got step one and two, grip and grooves. Step three is to place the club on the ground in the middle of their stance so that they're balanced and that the golf club is favoring the heel of the club ever so slightly. And then the fourth step is where the paper plates come in. We were to have the players point the club forward towards the, the target, the paper plate that was on the ground, so that the shaft of the club was pointing at the target and the grooves were vertical. Basically like the player was shaking hands with the target. Okay. That step was to, to recognize that the purpose of the game wasn't to hit the ball, but to swing the club in the direction of the target. Mm, that's that's an important distinction too. Swing that's towards the most the important of the steps. It's the most uh, underknown. Yeah, that's good. And then the fifth step was putting the club back in a dress and making a backswing and a forward swing while remembering the location of the target and mm. while maintaining their balance and while brushing the grass. Brushing the grass. Correct. Not you're not worrying you're not focused on divots and it's hitting the ball then the ground and then it's just brush the grass. Correct. Cut the cut the lawn. Absolutely. <laughs> There's somebody and made so we, a, we did a show on that. Somebody made a a a, a, a tool, a training aid mm -hmm. to just cut the lawn. Cut the lawn. It's got little grooves in the front of it. It's really valuable. Um sometimes I'll have players, young or old. Instead of working from the fairway, just move them to the rough a little bit, and that ball's sitting up a little bit nicer. And they can associate with brushing the grass. There's a little bit more margin of error right there, and they can actually hit some pretty good ones. Yeah, sometimes I'd much rather hit on on that first cut second than right on the, the tight little fairways. Um, yep. I mean, of course I want to be in the fairway, but you know, sometimes I just feel more comfortable. <laughs> I've got a little extra grass underneath there. Absolutely. Yeah, it'd be real intimidating hitting shots from, from the green, from that 
length of grass. Yeah, exactly. Especially if the green is 100 yards long. All right, listen, we're going to take one more break, um, <laughs> and then I want to come back, and I need some tips from you as the teacher, as the coach, um, not the instructor of a university program. But <laughs> we'll do that when we come back with Henry right after this. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, an episode that's never been shared publicly before as it was a members-only episode back in 2010. It's part two with golf instructor Rick Kosher, the Golf Better Coach. If you would, next time you go play, everywhere where you would use a nine iron, use a seven. A seven? Mm Mm-hmm. Fabricate the shot that you need. You will be surprised. When you allow your imagination to get in the way and stop trying to think about making the perfect 9-iron full swing, how well you'll be able to control a 7-iron shot. Allow yourself the opportunity to play a different club than you normally would and see how well you do at that. I grew up next to a golf course, and the guy who was the club champion came up every night after work and played as many holes as he could. And every night he came up to play He carried one golf club. So he played his six iron off the tee on the par five, played it all the way onto the green and putted out with it. He learned by doing this repetitively that I can make certain shots with this club because I can imagine what it is I wanted to do. That's episode 145 of Golf Smarter Mulligans being released this Friday. Golf Smarter Mulligans are the best podcasts from the early episodes of Golf Smarter that are just no longer available on any podcast app. Please subscribe, write a review, and follow both of our golf podcasts so that you can hear the brand new episode when it becomes available. Henry, I get emails a lot from people who are like, hey, my kid is getting old enough. I want to get my kid involved with golf. I want to get them to fall in love with the sport. What's the best way, you know, they're four or five years old, maybe three, maybe six, whatever it is. But what's the best way to get them started? What kind of tips can you give me to get a a little one started on the golf course and make it interesting for them? I'd say the first thing is to get them a coach. If that's available, get them a coach who really cares, who's invested in uh, their students, who's familiar working with young kids, um, who might have young kids of his or her own. Um, the you know PJ golf professionals are you know have a lot of different roles, and some of them are are very focused in youth golf, and so that could be a fantastic person um, to be not only a golf coach but a mentor. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of parents, though, if, if, if a parent isn't looking for a coach, the parent um, can introduce a child to the game. That's how I was introduced to the game. And at the end of the day, it, it needs to be fun. It needs to be a, uh, an experience that is shared. Um, being able to hit good golf shots and being able to have the desire to practice and to play in tournaments and to move on and maybe get a scholarship and play professional golf. Those are things that are so far down the road that sometimes parents get tied up in. Um, At the end of the day, a parent, if they're with their child on the golf course, I think they should both be playing and they should both be practicing together. There, you know, even a three or four or five year old, I mean, you can have a little putting game together, start them near the hole and, and, do some kind of a game that the child can can manage, that can have success with and can compete with. So doing some kind of a small putting game or a chipping game. It was interesting. My daughter, my oldest daughter, uh, had to have been f- four years old, maybe, like you're, you're asking about. And at the time, she had never said, Dad, you write better than I do, or you run faster than I do, or you lift heavier objects than I do. But when we went on the golf course, she said, Dad, you hit the ball further than I do. And that really clicked to me that for some reason, she didn't feel like a peer or equivalent or capable of her skills relative to mine on the golf course. And so what I do with young kids now is when we go play, I'll hit shots that they're capable of of hitting. 
Um, if their driver goes 100 yards, I'll play a little shot that goes 100 yards. And it looks about like there's the same kind of trajectory. And, and uh, when we get around the greens, uh, you know, instead of going real high with a shot that I could play, I'm going to have to play a shot that they're capable of playing so that they can see what those types of shots look like. And in all reality, it makes me a better golfer because sometimes those aren't my first option. And so I would need to, you know, work towards being able to play those. That's fascinating that you would um, not show up the kid, just like let them hit the ball and just do the same, you know, match them. Right. So you're saying it's like hit the ball the same height, get the same distance, but don't go, you know, all right. All right, Billy, go ahead and, and hit your driver. Oh, you hit that 20 yards. And then you pull out your driver and hit it 200 yards. It's like that's not helping the kid feel confident, right? Absolutely not. I mean, when we, when we teach them to play basketball, we have short hoops and, and you know, plastic air-filled balls. And when we play tennis, we're not going to bang, you know, serves at them. I mean, we're going to play a small, soft, slow game for them. We're going to do things that they're capable of, of doing. We're, we're trying to teach them the game. And sometimes right. that gets lost in golf. You know, golfers, that, that, that the parent will hit from their normal tee shot and play this big, long drive. And then they'll let the kid maybe duff a couple tee shots and then pick up and have to move up to mom or dad's drive. Or maybe they only let them chip and pot. And so immediately from the start, the, the, the child realizes that they're not really playing the same game. And in reality, they're kind of less than when they're together on the golf course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. Now, would you uh, advise someone, if they're just going out with their kid the first time, would you say driving range or putting green first? I mean, maybe both. I mean, I, I think that wherever the kid wants to go might be the place that, that I would go. When, when, when I try well, to get my girls yeah. to go to the golf course, I try to let them kind of guide, kind of drive the ship, and I kind of ride shotgun with them. Most people like but to don't get you want to, but I'm curious, don't you want to uh, give them the best opportunity to succeed? You know, because a driving range, I don't care how old you are when you're starting, a driving range is intimidating, all these balls flying and, you know, but with, a, with putting, and this is just in my head, but with putting, there's a little hole right in front of them. Just put the ball in the hole, just drop it in with your hands. Now let's roll it with our hands. And, you know, it's like, that's the success. And if they... I really believe if you can get a kid to fall in love with putting, everything else is going to be easy. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, in a, in a perfect world, I would start everybody from the green backwards, from the hole mm -hmm. backwards, right? Learning the smaller skills, creating building blocks to build upon. Uh, but I think our real success is going to lie in our new players, our kids in, in having fun and having good memories of, of the golf course. And if they really want to go over to the driving range early on and we continue to pull them to the putted green and continue to pull them to the chipping green, um, you know, that might be a bit of a turnoff to them. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do those things. I'm just saying that we need to be able to allow them to experience what they what it is that they're most interested in and then also sprinkle in what we know that they need. Right. Excellent advice. Oh, this is so interesting. I really appreciate it. That's, it's a hard one, too, because I get friends, you know, and people ask me a lot, how do I get my kid out there? Or how do I get my spouse to get interested in golf? Right? And the worst thing that you can do on either case is be constantly teaching and teaching and teaching because, yeah, you may not be the right person to be teaching right? A 15, 16 handicap shouldn't be out there giving instruction on how to play golf. Your first piece of advice is the best. Go get a coach. If the kid's interested, go get a teacher. You know, you, you're hiring a piano teacher. Before you start giving piano lessons, get him a golf coach. Yeah, I think a golf coach is the way to go. And, and that parent, you know, a parent should be taking their child out to play nine holes in the evening or six holes or three holes, sundown rates. There's a lot of nature on the golf course that a child's going to, you know, be infatuated with. The, going to the pond and looking for fish or turtles, seeing the rabbits, you know, 
the shade, maybe the you know in the trees in the evening as the sun setting. I mean, that's what a lot of us remember as young people learning the game or spending time with family. And so, if a parent can embrace that side of things and, and allow the child to explore the golf course, maybe letting groups play through as need be, uh, I think that's going to be the real secret for them to get their kids into the game. Great advice. Great advice, Coach. I love it. Really good. So, uh, Henry Statina, you can find uh, at Henry Statina Golf is um, on Instagram URL, whatever. You have a website. Um, H, let's see, wh- wh- what's your website? Give me that one. Website is my name, Henry Statina Golf.com. Perfect. And then you're at the New, New Mexico State University PGA Golf Management Program. A great program of in comparable to many huge universities. But if you're interested in getting a profession in golf or know somebody who wants to be a profession, have a profession in golf, it's a great, great option. Uh, Henry, I really appreciate your time. And um, let's plug your podcast real quickly. Yeah. So uh, during the pandemic, we started a podcast called the Straight Shooters Golf Podcast. Um, a fellow uh, NMSU graduate and friend, uh, Keith Bennett, uh, we both just started to uh, kind of have golf chats and interview some instructors and players in the game of golf. And so it's become quite the journey. And I'm looking forward to uh, picking your brain down the road on how we can uh, improve upon it. Get Ed LeBeau on your show. We have. He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Henry, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it, and best of luck. Thanks, Fred. I appreciate you having me on. Today's episode was introduced by Golf Smarter listener Ward Shaw of St. Louis, Missouri, and he's just won a full-year membership to Dynamic Golfers valued at $90. And now it's your turn. I want you to introduce an upcoming episode. Just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and let me know that you'd like to introduce our next episode. I'll assign you an episode number. Then you just call our toll-free Golf Smarter listener line. That's it. Yep, it's that easy. And you win a full year's membership to Dynamic Golfers. And here's your reminder to vote for Golf Smarter as the best golf podcast of the year in the inaugural Sports Podcast Awards. Go to sportspodcastawards.com and vote for Golf Smarter before March 1, 2022. Now they have 24 different sports categories, so you might find other sports shows that you listen to. But when it comes to the eight golf podcasts that have been shortlisted by the hundreds of entries, hopefully you'll vote for us. I'll leave a link in the show notes and on our website so that you can vote today. And speaking of podcasts, now that you're listening to one, and I thank you so much for being a podcast listener, we have a lot going on here at Smarter Podcasts, including a variety of business podcasts from ProTivity called Powerful Insights, The Post-Quantum World, and Board Perspectives. Crypto Changemakers with Danny Green is a new show where you can learn about new opportunities for social change using blockchain, crypto, and NFTs. And All the F Words, where two writer friends 30 years apart share their generational perspective each Friday on what they give an F about. Last week, Gabby and Joanne talked about faces. Joanne, I'm turning 40 in like two months, and I'm thinking I might need a facelift. You're not serious, sorry. What do you think? Oh my God, and you're saying this to someone who has jowls, whose neck is like a turkey. No, you don't need a facelift, but boy, are people getting facelifts these days. Here's my advice, Gabby. Moisturize, sunscreen, stop taking so many selfies. (laughs) This week on All the F Words podcast, we are talking about faces how they age, what your options are. We are anywhere you get your podcasts and you can follow us on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at all the F Words Pod. How does this look? Better. <laughs>